All right, so I'm John Kelly. Um, I'm an associate professor at Iowa State University, and I'm in the Department of Psychology and also the Human Computer Interaction Graduate Program. Um, and actually, that distribution in my position, I think, nicely reflects one of my, some of my core interests as a researcher. Um, specifically, um, I like to use virtual reality to study basic spatial cognitive theories. Um, virtual reality provides tight control and the appropriate experimental situations in which we um, can ask theoretical questions about spatial cognition, which is my area of expertise. Um, <clears throat> and furthermore, I like to use uh, spatial cognitive theory to um, address problems in HCI. So um, that's more along the lines of what I'll be talking about today, um, where we'll use some ideas from spatial cognitive theory to address um, problems um, ab uh, about locomotion techniques in virtual reality. So my presentation today is on spatial navigation, a concordance framework. I'll be talking about concordance um, <clears throat> as a way to think about um, locomotion interfaces in virtual reality. Um, so to give you a, a sense of where this project began, um, I'm going to ask, <clears throat> ask you to do an imagined task that I often ask of my students in some of my classes, but um, where I ask you to imagine walking along a path, <clears throat> and then at the end of that path to point back to the beginning, so point back um, to the path origin from the final perspective um, that you occupy along the path. Um, and so the path goes like this. Um, and so uh, I think this works better if you close your eyes. So those of you here, close your eyes. Um, imagine walking forward 10 feet. Imagine that you're in an open space, by the way, so you're not going to collide into obstacles. Imagine walking forward 10 feet, and then imagine turning to your right 90 degrees, so straight to your right, but just imagine, don't really turn. And now imagine walking forward another 10 feet, and that's the end of your path. Now keep your eyes closed and point back to the path origin. Okay, perfect. Now open your eyes. So what I typically see and what I saw here is two primary responses, back and to your left, or back into your right? <clears throat> I'll show you the right answer. Had you walked forward 10 feet and turned to the right 90 degrees, and then walked forward another 10 feet, um, you would now be at this point shown here at the end of the path, and the correct answer would be to point back into your right from the final perspective. Now, I think there are several reasons that people make this back into the left error in the imagined task. Um, <clears throat> I think that there are problems th that it's, you know, it's difficult to imagine a new perspective. It's also from an instructional perspective sometimes confusing, like do I imagine the task from where I am now or where I would end up at the end of the path? But the, the thing I want to focus on for this presentation is that another reason this task is difficult when imagining the path is that you're not really moving, right? You don't have self-motion cues that you would normally have if you would really walk this path. So if instead I had you actually walk along this path and turn and so on, um, everybody would get it right within a few degrees, right? It wouldn't be a difficult task. Um, certainly no one would point back into the left. Um, everyone would point mo more or less back into the right. And so I want to focus in on the, the importance of those self-motion cues, some generated by the body as you walk and you move your legs and get vestibular stimulation as you turn your head, and some generated by movement through the visual world, showing that you're um, moving forward and turning. So um, now I want to turn from that imaginary example of walking along a path to talking about locomotion interfaces in virtual reality. Now ideally, a, a, user, a virtual reality user would walk and turn to move through the virtual environment. And I say ideally because you can see what happens when we remove self-motion cues. People make some unusual errors that they wouldn't typically make if they were to really walk and turn. They point back into the left instead of back into the right. Um, so ideally, the user will physically walk and turn so that all those self-motion cues are available. Body-based, visual self-motion cues. Um, collectively. 
Um, but virtual environments, of course, are typically larger than the walkable track space. So now we're left with this problem of, well, how do we navigate a virtual environment that's inevitably going to be larger than the physical confines of the space um, that we're standing in? Um, so we need some kind of a locomotion interface. Well, um, <clears throat> I think the, the, the most obvious way to do this, um, given how, given the, the, the long history of using virtual environments in a video game context, um, would be to use a joystick um, to just rotate and turn using a joystick to produce smooth visual motion through the virtual environment, but not move your body at all. Um, and the problem, one problem with that um, is that it leads to cyber sickness. Um, so, <clears throat> um, seemingly out of nowhere, I think, it felt that way to me at least, um, teleporting has become um, the primary locomotion interface for getting around virtual environments. So teleporting is a technique where, if you've not experienced virtual reality before in this context, almost all of you certainly have, um, you point to a place you want to go in the environment and you're instantly transported there with generally no self-motion cues. So here's an example of one such teleporting interface. Um, so here, the user positions this little green circle in the virtual environment, and then upon release of the button is instantly transported to that location with no visual or body-based self-motion cues. Now, <clears throat> they are physically rotating and do get rotational visual self-motion cues as well, body-based and visual, but translational self-motion cues, that is associated with change in position, are totally absent. Um, and this reduces cyber sickness dramatically, which is excellent. <clears throat> um, I'll get to some of the potential consequences in a moment. Um, here's another flavor of the teleporting interface. Just like before, um, so this is from a game called Robo Recall. I should say these examples are from games, but of course these are relevant to all VR applications where you have to locomote through a large space. Um, so here the user is teleporting by, again, positioning a little circle on the ground. But now they're also orienting these arrows to specify not only their location, but their heading, um, the orientation that they'll occupy after they teleport. So now there are zero self-motion cues, body-based or visual, associated with movement through the environment, the virtual environment. Um, it's purely done through teleporting. So now there are no self-motion cues. Um, and both of these examples could be problematic given what I showed you in the initial example about what happens when we remove self-motion cues in the imagined example. Um, so the project I'll be telling you about, um, what I'll tell you about are you know, the early stages of this project, but we're asking questions like, what are the spatial cognitive consequences of teleporting? Um, if people have trouble pointing back to the, be to the beginning of their path in the imagined example I gave you, is that also true of what happens when people teleport? Um, does, does it lead to problems um, in learning a new spatial environment? Um, and furthermore, not only cata uh, cataloging the problems that it can create, um, what are some potential solutions? Um, given that teleporting seems like an effective solution to avoiding cyber sickness, or reducing it at least, what can we do to support it as a locomotion tool that will allow for um, nav spatial navigation that's more natural? Um, so, uh, my colleagues and I have um, come up with a way of describing, uh, uh, contextualizing these different interfaces, um, what I'll call the concordance framework. Um, so, I, I think probably all um, locomotion interfaces for virtual reality can be described based on their concordance, <clears throat> on the concordance between movement of, here it says the body, but really um, it that, that reflects my bias in thinking that body-based self-motion cues are maybe more important uh, than visual self-motion cues. I'm, I'm not sure that's true necessarily, but that's my bias. Um, <clears throat> but self-motion cues more generally. Um, so self-motion cues and movement through the virtual environment. So when teleporting, there are no self-motion cues associated with some aspects of movement. So, um, so on the basis of this... Uh, concordance, there are interfaces that are completely concordant, uh, as 
for example, when you physically walk and rotate to move through the environment. Um, in principle, other locomotion modes like riding a bike could also be concordant if you were truly moving, although typically you're not in those examples. Um, so uh, physically walking and rotating is, uh, produces um, uh, concordance between movement of the body, movement through the virtual environment. Um, partially concordant interfaces are um, <clears throat> examples where there's uh, some concordance, some, some degree of concordance, and some degree of discordance. So this, the first example of teleporting I showed you where the user physically rotates to turn through the environment, uh, but then uh, teleports to translate, to change position. That'd be a partially concordant interface. Some aspects of movement are concordant, some aspects are discordant. And then there are lots of examples of discordant interfaces, um, including the final example, uh, teleporting example I gave you, where from the Robo Recall game, where the user would teleport to both translate and rotate through the environment. So now there's no self motion indicating movement through the virtual world. Um, I'm not going to dig into the psych literature on this uh, other than to say that it exists, but um, there is research in spatial cognition indicating that the body, body based cues associated with um, translation and rotation may be important, um, are important. I say maybe because there's some disagreement as to which is more important, rotational or, body, or translational body based cues. But there's evidence that, that both may be. Uh, <clears throat> important for staying oriented in the environment. Um, and yet there's almost zero research on the spatial cognitive consequences of teleporting. The research that has been done on teleporting tends to be about whether it's um, easy to use, um, whether it reduces cyber sickness, which it does, relative to some other locomotion modes. Um, so that's what this project is about, is filling that gap in the research, identifying what are the spatial cognitive consequences, um, if any, and um, what are some potential solutions. So I'll tell you today about several experiments, maybe five if I can get through them all, but um, a number of experiments exploring um, two primary themes. Um, how does uh, the interface concordance affect some, what we're going to call spatial updating, that is how we keep track of where we are relative to the environment as we move around. So how does interface concordance affect spatial updating? And are there environmental cues that could potentially mitigate negative effects of interface discordance? So you know, having landmarks around, does that help you stay oriented even though you don't have self-motion cues, for example? So I'll go through some general methods that we've used in all of these experiments, and then the experiments after that kind of flow quickly from one another. Um, <clears throat> so we used a, we had participants performing a triangle completion task, which is what I've already asked you to do at the beginning when I asked you to imagine walking along this path. Um, so what they do is they walk uh, to three targets. Um, they first walk to a green vertical post that marks the start of their path, the path origin. They then walk to a, um, when they arrive at the green post, it disappears, and a yellow post appears, and that marks the first leg of the path on the outbound trajectory. Um, they walk to the yellow post, and then they walk to a red post that, that appears. Um, and when they get to the red post, they have to point back to the unseen location of the green post. So this requires spatial updating, keeping track of where you are in the environment, or where other environmental points are relative to where you are as you move around. Um, we had participants doing this task while wearing the HTC Vive head-mounted display. They'd travel the outbound path and then point back to the origin. Um, one thing that I'll explain in a little more detail in a moment is this uh, arrow at the base of each post. Um, the arrow pointed to the next post location, the upcoming post location. So from the yellow post, it's an arrow pointing to where the red post will be. And I'll tell you in a moment why we did that. Um, that's a departure from what's typically done in the spatial cognitive literature. Um, so the most important variable that I've kind of hinted at so far is uh, the, the navigation interface. Um, this is a repeated measures variable, meaning every participant completed the task in every condition um, in this variable. Um, so first uh, was our walking interface, uh, where the user would 
um, physically walk and turn and um, to get through the environment. Um, when I show you the data, I'll, I'll uh, represent that with this little character with the arrow indicating rotation and translation that they would physically move. This is a video of the task um, when using the walking interface. So they walk to the green post, and you saw that little arrow at the base saying where the yellow post would show up, and it shows up once they reach the green post. And then once they walk to the red post, it disappears as well. And now they use the, um, the Vive controller. Uh, they push a button, and it brings up a disk on the ground, and they position that to where they think the location of the green post would be. Um, and then they go on to the next trial. Um, <clears throat> the second interface was partially concordant teleporting, where they teleport to translate, change their position, uh, but they rotate their bodies to change their orientation. So here's the task using the partially concordant teleporting interface. So now there are no self-motion cues associated with the translational component of the legs of the path, but they rotate the body um, at the turn, and of course they also rotate to point to the path when they turn to face and point to the path origin. Uh, but the response is the same. And then lastly, discordant teleporting. This is like the robo-recall example, where um, now they're teleporting to change their location and their orientation. Um, the interface now has this purple triangle they're orienting rather than the uh, blue interface in the uh, last example I gave you. But um, now they're not rotating their bodies, and they're also not um, translating using their bodies. So there are no self-motion cues on the outbound path. They do rotate their bodies and get visual self-motion when they point back to the path origin. So in that sense, in all three interfaces, the response is exactly the same. They turn to face the path origin and they point. But the outbound path is being manipulated in terms of the self-motion cues available as they traverse that path. Uh, we manipulated the turn angle. <clears throat> could ra range from 22 to 135 degrees, could be left or right, um, so that not every triangle was exactly the same. We manipulated, to some extent, the relative path leg lengths, again, to keep the triangles a little different from trial to trial. Um, keep in mind, these all had to fit within my lab because they had to, we had, we, one interface is the walking interface, so they have to be able to walk those triangles. So these are relatively small triangles that would fit in the size of uh, my lab. Um, so the path leg lengths are, oh, roughly um, 6 to 10 feet um, per leg, something like that. Uh, we had 24 participants in each experiment, and they completed each of these different um, <clears throat> conditions. Um, we measured the pointing response location. We also measured the pointing uh, response time. I'm only going to look at today the, um, the errors associated with the pointing response locations. So in the first experiment, um, we added one more manipulation beyond what I've shown you already, which is we manipulated the virtual environment. So either it could be an open field which is uh, the videos I showed you already were the open field videos. There are no landmarks, nothing, just this open grassy field. Um, and we also had participants do the same task in the landmarks virtual environment. Uh, here's a video of the walking interface in the landmarks virtual environment. You can see there are distant landmarks at the horizon every 90 degrees. So there's mountains, a bridge, and a building, those kinds of things. Um, and then there are some closer landmarks, not really close, but closer. Um, there's a tree, a park bench, a tent, some other stuff. Um, we didn't put anything really close because uh, we didn't want it within the walking space that people would have to either you know, move around um, as they're walking or um, cues that people could use to remember, oh, I just have to point back to the bench. That's where I started, right? We wanted them to actually do spatial updating keeping track of where they are, as opposed to saying, I'll just point back to the bench after I finish this task. So two virtual environments, open field and <clears throat> um, landmarks. These are 
raw data, more or less, from the first experiment. Um, each orange dot represents a, a, a response where the path origin is represented by the black dot in the middle of those orange dots. And the path terminus is represented by the X at the, um, at the uh, origin here. Um, and so this could be, these could be responses to a, a triangle like the one shown here. Um, it could be a triangle like this one with a more acute or a larger turn angle. Um, and those are all kind of normalized to put them on the same figure. <clears throat> so um, blue, blue dots are partially concordant teleporting. Green dots are discordant teleporting. And the thing that should jump out to you is the change in the distribution. That is, it just gets broader and broader the more you remove these self-motion cues. To the extent that it almost looks random in the discordant teleporting condition. Um, I'll show you later that it's not random, um, but it looks like they're doing pretty poorly. Um, those are data from the open field environment. At the bottom are the same data, uh, same interfaces shown for the landmarks virtual environment. And um, it's not obvious that there's a difference in the distributions. I'll show you some, uh, we've quantified this in a couple different ways. Um, and I'll show you that on the next slide. Um, this is the only time I'll show you the raw data. After this, I'll show you just summary data, bar graphs, averaging um, errors. So the way we decided to analyze these data is based on the absolute distance of the average absolute distance of each point from the path origin. Um, so there are lots of ways you could um, uh, describe error. Um, and the way I'll show you here is looking at absolute distance error. So the farther you are from the target, the larger your absolute distance. So that's what I'm showing here. These are absolute errors in the pointing distance in meters as a function of the three interfaces. So walking, partially concordant teleporting, where they rotate the body but then teleport to translate. And then discordant teleporting, where they teleport to both translate and rotate. And then the white bars are the open field, and the gray bars are for landmarks. So the, the two things I want to draw your attention to, one is this effective navigation interface. Errors are lowest in walking, lower in walking than in partially concordant teleporting, and lower in partially concordant teleporting than discordant teleporting. And so there clearly is this effect of removal of self-motion cues. Errors get larger as you remove more self-motion cues. Um, that didn't surprise me too much, although the literature, the spatial cognitive literature, some of it suggests rotational cues are sufficient, um, which would have suggested that these partially discordant, uh, sorry, partially concordant errors um, should be similar to the, to the walking errors because they are rotating their bodies, and in fact, it's not the same. Um, they're, they're doing worse. Um, <clears throat> so these errors, the error data as a, fu as a function of interface didn't surprise me too much. Um, the biggest surprise is that the landmarks have no effect. Um, you'd think, gosh, if they're doing so badly, especially in the discordant teleporting case, how is it possible that they're not using landmarks to help them or that the landmarks are not helpful? Um, so we thought of a lot of different reasons for this. Maybe they're not paying attention, right? Maybe they're not motivated or they're just overwhelmed by the task or something. Um, maybe they didn't get enough time to learn the landmarks, um, things that could be maybe attentional issues. Um, the distance to the landmarks, they're all pretty far away. Maybe they were so far away um, that they were more or less outside the field of view as when they're doing the task. So when, <clears throat> because these path leg lengths are pretty short, the user has mostly got their head tilted downward and therefore not seeing a lot of the landmarks that are far away, um, certainly not in the periphery. Um, the landmarks are arranged in a, in a pretty random way. Um, maybe they, if, they had more, if they had more structure, that maybe could help. Oh, I wanted to emphasize that uh, they are uh, doing very poorly in the discordant teleporting condition but they're doing better than chance. Um, so this is their absolute angular error, uh, where 90 degrees would be chance performance. 
Um, so absolute angular error ranges from 0 to 180. So on average, it would, if you just pointed randomly, it'd end up at 90 degrees. Um, they're doing better than 90 degrees in all the conditions. So in the second experiment, we did something that's very not, it kind of goes against my training as a psychologist. In psychology, we like to change one little thing and see what happens, and then change another little thing and then see what happens. In this experiment, we changed everything. Um, we um, moved from the landmarks virtual environment to an indoor classroom. And we did it because um, in our lab, we were playing around with this task in different environments, and it just felt easier in this virtual classroom environment that we had. And we thought, well, let's try it and see if it is, in fact, easier. And if it is, then we'll kind of work backward and figure out, well, what are the critical factors that make it easier? Um, so we use this indoor built environment. It's a classroom. I'll show you a video of the task within the environment. It was modeled after a real classroom on campus here at Iowa State in the psychology department. So there are, um, it's a more or less a square room, um, lots of landmarks, um, you know, a blackboard, a door, other things that are <clears throat> um, clearly distinguish the different walls. And there's a lot of research in psychology, uh, spatial cognition, indicating that um, boundaries may be a, a particularly important thing for navigation. That is, that humans um, are strongly affected by boundaries within an environment. That affects our spatial memory. Um, there are neurons, in the, at least in the animal brain, that respond in particular to boundaries at certain orientations. And so indoor environments, um, um, of course, have lots of boundaries, walls. So we did the same experiment, same three interfaces, except we now have um, two, two virtual environments that are a little different. We used the open field from before as the baseline, worst case scenario, and we compared that to performance in this classroom virtual environment. Um, so now the data look different. Um, again, we're looking at absolute error, excuse me, absolute error. <coughs> um, as a function of the three different interfaces. Um, the open field data look just like before. Um, people get progressively worse, um, and the, the errors are similar in magnitude as the first experiment. Um, in the classroom, errors get worse as you remove self-motion cues, but to a lesser extent than in the open field, such that for the partially concordant and discordant interfaces, um, People are performing better um, in the classroom than in the open field. So they're, they're still doing worse as you remove body-based and visual self-motion cues, even in the classroom, but that negative effect is mitigated um, to some extent um, in the classroom compared to the open field. So this is great news, right? There's something we can do that will help people. Um, uh, from a theoretical perspective, well, and, and an applied perspective, and we want to know, well, what is it that's helping, right? What's, what's significantly different about between this environment and the Landmarks virtual environment so that we could now tell a designer, like, hey, this is what you need to add in your environment in order to reduce disorientation as a result of, um, that could result from teleporting. So there are lots of differences, of course. Um, differences in scale, uh, indoor versus outdoor, um, the room walls, I mentioned the boundaries, um, distance to the landmarks. Um, <clears throat> based on what I had mentioned before about the significance of boundaries in the, um, in the spatial cognitive literature, um, we decided that that seemed like a, a, a potential cue that could be particularly helpful in the classroom that's missing from the landmarks virtual environment. Um, so in the third experiment, we went back to our Landmarks virtual environment and we added in a fence that mimicked the boundaries of the classroom. Um, they were of basically the same scale. Um, here's a video from that environment. So it's the same Landmarks virtual environment. Now it has a low fence that allows you to see all the landmarks beyond, but it provides a boundary um, that's similar to the boundary, at least in, so, in the you know, XY size, not in vertical height, um, <clears throat> but similar in the, in the walking space um, as the classroom. So again, we have three interfaces. 
two virtual environments, the open field as our baseline worst case scenario, and then the um, fence in landmarks virtual environment. Um, <clears throat> in this experiment, the data look almost identical to the, to the last experiment, experiment two with the classroom. Um, here we have absolute error, and <clears throat> again, in the open field, errors get um, considerably worse as you remove self-motion cues. Um, but those errors are reduced in the uh, partially concordant teleporting and discordant teleporting conditions when we add in this fence. So the landmarks alone weren't helpful, but adding in a square fence um, to the landmark environment did help people to stay oriented. I mean, again, not perfectly. There are still errors that, that um, are introduced as we remove self-motion cues, but they're doing better um, than in the open field or landmarks alone. And I should say these data from the fence and landmarks are statistically indistinguishable from the classroom data. So they're doing, they're performing equally well in those two environments. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so why did the landmarks plus fence help? Uh, but the landmarks alone did not. Um, one, one theory is that the boundary alone might be sufficient, right? Maybe the landmarks in this landmarks and fence environment were just superfluous. They did nothing. All that we needed to do was have this fence. That's all people need. Um, or <clears throat> another possibility is that the landmarks are only useful in the context of a boundary so that the boundary helps the user make sense of the landmarks. That's another way to think about it. Um, <clears throat> and if we can answer this question, we can better advise um, as to how um, virtual, virtual reality developers should design their environments. That is, do they need landmarks? Do they need boundaries? Do they need both? <clears throat> so in the last experiment I'll tell you about, um, <clears throat> we had participants perform this task in the fence by itself in an environment with a, with a fence only um, so as to see whether the, the, the boundary is sufficient, even though it's ambiguous. Um, it could be sufficient. Um, it's ambiguous in the sense that the four sides of the fence, it's a square fence, so if you were completely disoriented, you'd have a one in four chance of, dis of reorienting successfully. Um, so we compared, again, these three interfaces in the fence only and the fence and landmarks virtual environment <clears throat> to see if the fence by itself was sufficient. So fence only looks just like the open field, but now we've got the fence included. Um, just like before, walking is better than partially concordant teleporting, which is better than discordant teleporting. <clears throat> the thing that's different about um, this experiment that compared to the last is that, um, so here, one thing I want to point out is that we no longer have the open field as a, as a baseline comparison. So we're doing fence only versus fence and landmarks. And <clears throat> you can see that the fence only is sufficient so having that ambiguous geometric boundary is just as good as, as having the boundary plus landmarks in the partially concordant teleporting. Um, here, this is a significantly, statistically significant difference. So here, they're doing better when they have the landmarks than when they have the fence by itself. Um, so probably what happens is sometimes they get sufficiently turned around because of this discordant interface and the fence in that case may not be sufficient to help them reorient and the landmarks are needed to do that. <clears throat> um, actually, I will show the last experiment and, and, and then skip a little bit of a different future direction. Um, <clears throat> so the last experiment um, is again testing this idea that landmarks may be helpful primarily in the context of a boundary. That is that the landmarks, even though they're not helpful on their own, they can provide a kind of an orientation to the boundary so that I can know that you know, that side of the square fence is like you know, north or something, right? It's the mountain side of the square fence. Um, so it provides an orientation to the boundary. We thought a particularly strong test of that would be to <clears throat> evaluate the whether landmarks are helpful in the context of a fence that is on its own totally ambiguous. So in this case, we had an environment with a circular fence that is 
essentially useless on its own. Um, and we thought, well, if the landmarks are useful in the context of a totally ambiguous boundary, then that would really support this idea that landmarks are um, useful as a way of providing an orientation to a boundary. Um, so we had the circular fence by itself as a baseline condition. We didn't expect that would provide a useful cue. And then uh, <clears throat> um, circular fence with landmarks as a comparison. So here's the circular fence with the landmarks. So the same landmarks environment as before, just adding in a circular fence. Okay, and now the data. Um, these data look a lot like what I've shown you before, like in the classroom example for um, experiment two. Um, so again, we get this graded effect of self-motion cues. Uh, as we remove them, performance gets worse. Um, but now <clears throat> performance is better, um, so circle only, circular fence only are the white bars, gray bars are circle plus landmarks. Um, performance is better when the landmarks are available, suggesting that landmarks are helpful in the context of a boundary. They provide, they make the boundary more useful. Um, even though on their own they may not be um, particularly helpful. Um, so I'm going <clears> to <throat> skip this little bit on individual differences for the moment um, and go to my summary and future directions. So um, teleporting negatively affects <coughs> excuse me, spatial updating, the process of keeping track of our position and orientation in the environment. Um, discordant teleporting is worse than partially concordant teleporting. That is, the, the, the more self-motion cues that are available, and, and um, the better you do. Um, in, but in both cases, there's uh, a reasonable, reasonably high potential for disorientation. Um, that's one way to explain a large error in, in a spatial updating task, is that the person is disoriented. Um, and so I think that it ought to be a goal to preserve self-motion cues to the extent possible. Um, environmental boundaries can mitigate the negative effects of interface discordance. Um, boundaries, landmarks are also helpful, um, but particularly in the context of boundaries. <clears throat> um, and I'll skip that last bit about mental rotation and I'll bring it up instead in the context of some future directions. Um, so some directions we're going um, with this project um, one is um, evaluating individual differences. When we look at our data, I, I showed you summary data across um, 24 participants. These were average errors. When you look at individual participants, there are some individuals who do well in all three interfaces and seem hardly at all affected by removal of self-motion cues. So some individuals are better than others, but some individuals are also more immune to the, to the consequences of removing self-motion cues. And we'd like to identify characteristics of those individuals that could predict whether or not they're going to be negatively affected by, um, by the interface so that we could then make recommendations. You know, given that, you're, that you have these characteristics um, on maybe some paper and pencil kinds of spatial cognitive tasks, um, you can use whatever interface you want, or you ought to consider walking whenever possible, right, to avoid disorientation. Um, so evaluating individual differences as a way to provide more personalized recommendations for um, the interface and the environment to provide, to promote um, a better user experience. Um, we're also <clears throat> evaluating um, the effect of these different interfaces on larger scale movement. So the examples I showed you, the experiments I showed you, were all small scale triangles because we wanted to have people walk in one of the conditions so we were limited in physical space. Um, but in reality, people teleport to move larger distances. Um, so do these effects of interface discordance um, also characterize large scale movement when you're exploring a large space and moving over larger distances? Um, <clears throat> what happens when we um, augment the interface with a little bit of optic flow, uh, for example, like a little bit of self-motion cue. Um, here's an example from um, uh, 
a game called um, Doom. So this is the teleporting interface in Doom. Um, they teleport to translate, uh, but there's also fast optic flow that seems to not cause a lot of um, cyber sickness. Um, and does that self motion, visual self motion, then does it really support spatial updating and spatial orientation? Um, so as we get into questions like this, you know, can we provide a little bit of self motion information and does that help? Now we need to start asking about cyber sickness. You know, are we making, are we helping people keep track of where they are at the expense of something else like cyber sickness? Um, one thing that <clears throat> is true of the interface I just showed you is that <clears throat> um, examples like this tend to have no acceleration and deceleration in the optic flow. It's just a constant velocity and it's pretty fast, presumably to mitigate um, cyber sickness. Um, what are the effects of interface discordance on cognitive map formation? So I've given you examples of the, uh, uh, data from experiments where we have this really small you know, triangle completion task, point back to where you started. But that's not the goal of a virtual environment, right? You need to learn a space so you can travel through it and return to remembered locations um, <clears throat> that are much larger in scale than this little triangle. Um, so what are the effects of interface discordance on large-scale spatial learning um, in more complex environments? Um, and then lastly, um, can we train people? Um, do people learn with practice? These are all, all of our participants Almost all of our participants are new to virtual reality and don't have a lot of experience. But um, if you have a lot of experience with VR and teleporting, um, will you do better at this kind of a task? And is it directly because of your experience? Um, can we train people? Um, so um, ways of looking at you know, not just measuring things about the individual that might predict their performance, but now are there things we can change in the individual? by giving them feedback and practice. Uh, OK, lastly, I should stop here. Uh, um, I want to thank my collaborators, um, Lucia Cherup, Alex Lim, and Alec Ostrander, our graduate students in HCI here at Iowa State. Dr. Stephen Gilbert, as well, is um, involved in this project that was funded by the National Science Foundation and was also part of, um, uh, it sort of began a, a, with some pilot projects that were part of a, a research experiences for undergraduates program um, a couple summers ago, also an NSF program. Um, all right, and thank you. <clears throat> all right. Do we have time? Thank you. Do we have time for questions? I, I, yeah. I, I sort of, I, I kind of forgot what the, what the real time is. It says 147 up here, but I'm guessing 152. So okay. So if people online want to put questions in the chat, we can um, then repeat your questions up to Dr. Kelly. Um, and I'm assuming that people like Andrea and Jennifer, Brian, Amy, you can hear me. Um, and so I'm going to put it, let's see. <coughs> A couple other things I can show you. Um, I don't know. I, I'll wait for questions as well. But um, here's a question. Yep. Jennifer asks, "Do you worry about the emotional impact of AR or VR?" <clears throat> emotional impact. Uh, Jennifer, you want to elaborate any? I don't know. If, like, I'm... I mean, one thing I can say while Jennifer's elaborating um, is that I do think disorientation is a negative emotional experience. Um, this is going to go you know, several steps farther. But um, in, in situations where individuals are being interrogated, for example, in a, um, <clears throat> you know, in a, in a war setting, for example, um, disorientation is a big part of what they do during interrogation. That is to make them feel uncomfortable. They disorient them and make sure they don't know what time of day it is or where they are, or anything um, that would help them you know, orient in time and space. Um, and I think that they do that because of the emotional consequences of it. Um, so to that end, I think disorientation is a negative emotional experience. Um, you know, nobody likes to feel like they're lost. In the real world, it can feel kind of, you can feel a little panicked, you know, if you feel like, oh, God, where am I? Where's my car, right? That's kind of a negative emotional experience. 
um, being in a new place and being lost. Um, and I think the same thing can happen in VR. She notes that she was thinking about disorientation and how these experiences can feel very real and possibly be uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I agree. And there's the PTSD sort of work as well. Yeah. You know, I think people talk about, when people talk about discomfort in VR, a lot of, a lot of what they talk about is, uh, in, in preventing that, is things like cyber sickness, right? You know, like make people feel more comfortable. Um, but because, of course, if you need people to have a, good, a positive experience in a virtual environment if you hope that they'll return. <clears throat> um, I think the same is true with spatial orientation. And that goes back to some of the individual differences stuff we're doing. In fact, probably this whole project. But you know, figuring out, well, what is it, you know, what are your limits as an individual? How can we, what interfaces will allow you to stay oriented? What environments will allow you to stay oriented um, so that you can have the most comfortable experience? You know, being disoriented um, obviously will impact your ability to perform whatever tasks you plan on doing in the virtual environment, but will also generally lead to, you know, uneasiness, feeling disoriented, like I can't do this. And yeah, I think that's a good question. A uh, question I have is about um, the uh, there are people who are used to being out on ships. Right? And mm -hmm. when you're out on a ship, you don't really have proximal landmarks typically. You're surrounded by even water, and you're having to navigate either with stars or I'm aiming for this, you know, away from this lighthouse or something. So, it, are there people who would be, you know, very experienced sailors? Are they going to have a different experience with this somehow or use different tactics or any thoughts? Yeah. So, yeah. So, the idea of um, traveling on a ship. <clears throat> I think actually Charles Darwin came up with this term, dead reckoning, is often a term that's used in, in spatial cognition, but also in navigation more generally. Um, that is, you know, um, I, I know this point um, at time one, and then I keep track of how far I've traveled. I know this point at time two, and trying to figure out, well, where am I now? Um, and <clears throat> there are strategies that people develop to enable you know, successful dead reckoning in situations like traveling at sea. My sense is that those are probably not going to translate very well to keeping track of where you are in this scale of environment. Um, not to say that the strategies wouldn't be helpful, but that a person who's used to using that strategy at sea might um, require just as much <laughs> sort of training in the virtual environment as a person who's never done that sort of work before. Um, <clears throat> but I do think that that's, I mean, that's essentially the problem. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dead reckoning task. Um, I think of, uh, you know, there are lots of examples of, you know, military um, training that involve, you know, establishing your orientation um, and where you are, where you've been. <clears throat> Those tend to be over large scale spaces, though and not over a small scale, you know, here's where I traveled, you know, 50 feet back or something. Um, so I think the strategy in, in principle would apply, um, but in practice, I, I don't know that they would necessarily even think to use that. You know, that'd be, an inter it'd be interesting to see. <clears throat> but it really is the same problem. Yeah. So other questions out there? We have time for one more. <clears throat> Uh, do you think as people start to use Google Maps more that they are just not building any mental maps anymore and they're going to be unpracticed at this anyway? Like if we ran our studies about this this year versus five, 10 years ago, would it be different because of that factor? I don't think so. I think the thing that having such wide access to maps does um, <clears throat> is that it reinforces this kind of north up um, reference frame and spaces that we know, like I've looked at the Ames map so many times because I've, you know, looked at directions to things and so on, um, and it's always north up. And so everybody has this, what that does is it leads to a spatial memory of that space that's oriented basically in a north up kind of framework. But, but ultimately, <clears throat> even though we have technology to support navigation, it's still more convenient to learn through you know, typical navigation modes. Um, and I still need to figure out where I am and how haul, right? Um, um, 
not just where how hall is in the context of campus or aims or so on um, so i don't think my I mean, my personal opinion is no um, that it doesn't have a dramatic effect i think if anything it's possible that people who play a lot of video games or spend a lot of time in vr speaking of, kind of the, the effects of technology um, could end up becoming better navigators as a result of being forced into situations where navigational cues are reduced, and now they've got to come up with new strategies to solve that problem, whether it be paying more attention to cues in the environment or um, developing strategies to better keep track of where they are as they move around. <clears throat> um, so, uh, but, but that's also an open question. Yeah. Do you have time for one more? Absolutely. Uh, Brian mentions, uh, He's saying that, for example, in Robo Recall, it doesn't really matter if you're tracking where you are and where you've been. They're not really critical for success. And so, is it, um, he's saying, if tracking where I have been is really meaningful in a lot of VR experiences, are there examples where having an accurate idea of where you are relative to where you've been is more critical? Um, so, I would say certainly there are examples where, that you could imagine where it doesn't matter. Right, where your guide, where the where the environment guides you through, um, so and you never have to be in charge of returning back to where you've been. Um, but in most cases, in most virtual environments I've experienced, and certainly this is true in all real environments, you've got to be able to figure out where you've been to the extent that you know I've got to figure out how to get back to the to the door that led me into this room to begin with, right? So I can find my way out. Um, so I, I think that. Certainly there are going to be cases where you don't need to keep track of where you are. Um, hospitals try to reduce the extent to which you have to do that by drawing a little line on the floor saying, you know, if you're here for this purpose, follow these lines to reduce the demand, the cognitive demand. Um, but in all other situations where those kinds of tools aren't available, you basically have to know where you are in order to find your way back to your car or find your way back to a um, you know, a, a critical part of the of the game that you're playing, or whatever it is, um, especially games that are more like exploration-based games. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again. Thanks.